right. So the recorder is on, audio is good. I'm just waiting for, there we go. <clears throat> so it's 1030 right now. I'm going to get started with the class. What we'll be talking about today is how to call a return from subroutines. <clears throat> so it might be noteworthy to mention that all the topics you know, today or from here on, they're going to rely on your understanding of the other material that we have talked about in this class. Some can go all the way back to binary subtraction, binary comparison, the flags, and then other ones you will go back to the instruction set. So that means you know, in order to get these topics down, we really have to get the TTP instructions down, like which one does what. <clears throat> At this point, I'm not too concerned about how the instructions get the job done. I just need to know what is being done by the instructions. So the opcode table is still going to be useful because you know, even though we don't care about how it is done inside TDP, like inside Logisim, we still need to know what each instruction does. So that means you know, the focus is going to be on column C or the RTL. Several people ask me what is RTL in the exam. RTL stands for Register Transfer Language, which I believe I have talked about a few times. Okay, <clears throat> So every time I talk about something new and people are not writing down something, you know, I start to worry because it's like, how are you guys going to get this down? Yes. Yes, it is being recorded. Yep. All right. So what we'll do is we'll continue with this topic here, okay, which digress a little bit to talk about the stack. So the stack is basically what we call a LIFO, last in, first out storage system, as opposed to first in, first out. So when you line up at Costco or Safeway or Walmart to pay for something, it is called first in, first out, which means the first person who gets to the line gets to be served first. The last person who gets to the line at the end of the day is the last person who gets served. So that's one way of storing and retrieving items. The other way is called last in, first out, which is LIFO. <clears throat> and last in, first out is also what we call a stack. The last thing that you put into the container is the first thing that you retrieve from the container. So are we okay so far with that concept? Okay, I can give you an example. <clears throat> of a last in first out, your refrigerator. So unless you're very disciplined, okay, every time you go buy grocery, let's say you bought you know broccoli and milk, okay? <clears throat> so you get all the stuff home and you know they need to be refrigerated. So how many people would clear out your know, shelves of your refrigerator, get all the new items all the way to the back of the shelf, and then put everything back just so that you know you don't <clears throat> ignore items that have been in the fridge for a while. We don't do that, right? Okay, so we, when we get home, we push the thing you know, so that we make room for the new items and then we just put it on the shelf. So that means if you already have another jug of milk or if you have you know, more broccoli than you bought last week, th those do not get consumed. When you open the fridge and go like, oh, I need to cook you know, some vegetables, you grab the broccoli that you just bought. So all the stuff in the back of the shelf, what do they do? They become a mold garden with all the bright colors, right? So that is a last in, first out example, even though that's not how we would like it to be. But the refrigerator does not lend itself to be a first in, first out kind of structure. It is more you know, suitable as a last in, first out structure which is unfortunate. This is how we end up with a lot of spoiled food because we only take out you know, the items that we just bought. All the stuff that we bought last week, or the week before last and so on, they're all just kind of rotting in the back of each shelf. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so now we can go into the C code, okay? The, so we first take a look at an example of how we use subroutines, you know, just to make sure that we all understand what a subroutine is or function, okay? So when I say subroutine, it is meaning exactly the same thing as a function. Because your function is the word that we use you know, in C and C++ to describe you know, what a subroutine is. Subroutine is kind of like an old fashioned term. I am guessing IBM you know, used that term first you know, in the 60s. <clears throat> so those two are really the same thing. So in this you know, particular program, we have main. <clears throat> main has two function calls 
one fun function call to f is here, one fun function call to f is over here. Function f does not do anything particularly useful. It does not even return a value. It's a void function. And then we get to the return you know, zero at the end of main. So you might look at this program and say, it doesn't do a single thing. Well, you are right, okay? It really does not do a single thing that is useful. However, it is a useful example to illustrate how call and return works. So when we think about, you know, with all the instructions that we have introduced up to this point, the calling part is not a problem, right? Because from the perspective of line seven, we just want to be able to continue execution, you know, at the code where f is representing. We can do that with a single instruction. Which instruction would you use if you want to continue execution at a particular place? Sorry? JMPI, that's right, okay. So JMPI is what we use to change the direction or change the path of how we execute the program. So if you want to continue execution at the label f, JMPI phase F that will get the job done. <clears throat> the trick is how do we get back? So when F is done, it has to go back to main. So can someone tell me which line F is supposed to get back to after the first call of F in main? Where do I go back to continue execution in main? Which line? Line eight, very good, okay? Because we cannot go back to line seven. If we go back to line seven, then we end up with somewhat you know, of a loop because we're gonna call F again, it goes back to line seven, we call F again, and so on and so forth. So as we go to line eight, we go like, oh, we can use a JMPI too, not a problem, okay? So at the end of you know, whatever code F is supposed to do, we just can say JMPI to whatever label that we want to define after the function call of, the first function call of F. But that is not gonna work. Okay, that is not gonna work because we have a second call to F. So the second call to F on line eight is gonna have a JMPI to F again, okay, not a problem. Getting to the subroutine is not a problem. Getting back from the subroutine is the problem. Because the second call to F says, oh, I don't wanna go back to line eight, I wanna go to line nine when I'm done. But JMPI cannot change where it goes to because the, the I, the immediate part, has to be a value that is determined at assemble time, not at runtime. Okay? <clears throat> so I'm gonna pause here because I just mentioned two phrases or two descriptions, and nobody seemed to be asking a question. Do we all understand what is the differences between assemble time versus runtime? A value that is determined at assemble time versus a value that is determined at runtime. <clears throat> Not exactly, okay, that's good. So a, a value that is determined at assemble time means as you run the program, that value cannot change anymore. So that means you know, with a JMPI, the destination of a JMPI is one of those things where it has to be determined by assemble time. When you run the program, you cannot dynamically go like, you know, it's the, JMP, it's the same JMPI instruction, but this time I want to go to that destination. You cannot do that with JMPI, okay? So that's the problem with, you know, with this code here, is how does F know where to go back to? And I have not even touched on recursion, recursion or the problems that can be posed by you know, recursion. <clears throat> so this is the setup of the problem. So in order to solve this problem, we have a quick digression to talk about what a stack is and how we implement a stack. So in this case, you know, I'm going to give you some code examples. Um, and this is also a good time to remind people that reading ahead of time is really important, especially at this point, because you know, the concepts are more abstract now and they also need a little bit more time to sink in. So reading the material ahead of time is going to be helpful. <clears throat> So now we have three lines of C code here. The first line can be done using a const. If you want to say const unsigned uh, stack size equals to 32, that works too, okay? We just need a symbolic name so that we know what is the total number of bytes we are reserving in the stack array. The second line is a declaration of stack, which is basically just an array of, in this case, 32 bytes. And then the third line is declaring a stack pointer 
which is in the form of a pointer to a byte. So do we have any questions about these three declarations by themselves? One is, an, one is a constant, one is an array, and one is a pointer, okay? So in TTP, we assume the stack is from location 255 to the last byte available after the program takes up space. So to uh, explain that, <clears throat> I think it's gonna be helpful to show you some code here. So let me turn on the tablet first. Uh, screen copy. And then I just need to move that to where you can see it. Like that. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is to draw a map of the RAM that the uh, processor has. So if I look at this as the entire memory space, this would be location 00, zero in hexadecimal, and the last one is gonna be location FF in hexadecimal. So I'm just pretending this is the entire RAM space. Your program is always gonna start from the low end, which means your code, whatever you load from the assembler, is going to fill in RAM in this direction. So basically this is your code. All right, so the stack is gonna grow in the opposite direction. It's gonna grow from the top down. So that means that the stack is gonna go in this direction. This is the stack. So anything that is not a part of your code is basically a part of the stack. Or you can also look at the stack as whatever is left over after you have your code loaded into the RAM of the processor. Is that okay so far? Okay. So the from the concept perspective, we have code and then we have stack. <clears throat> in this class, we don't have a heap. We do not do dynamically allocated memory stuff. So there's no, there's no malloc, there's no new, there's no delete, you know, that sort of thing. We just have a stack. All right, so this is the overall picture. <clears throat> so when you want to push something on the stack, so to push something on the stack means you're storing something on the stack. So imagine that you have your refrigerator, okay? You go like, okay, I need to store this bag of grocery or uh, broccoli you know, into the refrigerator. That storing action is called a push when we are referring to storing into a stack, it is called a push. <clears throat> so when you want to store something, we have two uh, operations to perform. The first one is we decrement the stack pointer and then we store whatever value you want to save at the location that the stack pointer is pointing to. So the first part is kind of reserving the space. The second part to, is to copy something to the space that we just reserved. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's always gonna be in this particular order. You always have to reserve first, and then you go like, okay, now that I have reserved one, two, or three bytes, or whatever number of bytes, I can now store values into the bytes, into the locations that I have reserved. <clears throat> is that okay so far? I'll show you examples later on. I'll show you actual examples later on. So when you want to retrieve items from the stack, like, okay, I want to retrieve the last thing that I push on the stack, it is called a pop operation. So popping is to ret retrieve items from the stack. So the way we retrieve items from the stack is exactly the opposite. We look at the stack pointer and ask, where are you pointing at? Whatever you're pointing at, okay, the content that you're pointing at, is the thing that I'm retrieving. So after I retrieve, I put it into typically a register in the case of assembly language programming, but in C you can store it into any variable. And then after that, the location that contains the item that we just retrieved is no longer useful. So we add one to the stack pointer so that we quote unquote deallocate that one byte that already had its value retrieved. Is that okay? So we have push, which is to store something, and then we have pop, which is to retrieve something. When you push, you have to allocate a space, and then you write to the space that you just allocated. When you pop, you retrieve whatever the stack point is pointing to, then you quote unquote deallocate that location by moving the stack point back up again. All right, so let's take a look at some actions or you know, let's finish up the initialization first. So the initialization is the stack pointer has to point to 
the byte that is right past the end of the array that we're allocating. The reason why this is the case is because if you're pushing, the first thing you do is you decrement the stack pointer. So that means you know, if you have the stack pointer pointing just past the end of the array, this will make it point to the very last byte that is in fact a part of the stack. So that means you know, now you can actually store something to that particular location. So are we okay so far with this? Okay. So we can now you know, take a look at it. Uh, we can take a look at an example. I'm switching to the tablet. <clears throat> there we go. So we'll go ahead and say, you know, what if we want to push a value of five first? Okay. So we're pushing a value of five, and assuming that the stack pointer was pointing here to begin with, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is to decrement the stack pointer. So that means the stack pointer has to be decreased to lower to, to the next available location. So I'm, I can do this here <clears throat> because I can you know, use a lasso tool and I can just highlight whatever portion I want to move and then I can just move it. Unfortunately, it is moving a part of the F2. So give me a second here to, to fix that problem. Get rid of that and make sure we have the F here. And then I can now move the stack pointer again. Oh, use the wrong tool. Okay. So the first thing we do is we move the stack pointer and then we store the five, the value of five to where the stack pointer is pointing to. So that means at this point, the second step is going to put a five here. <clears throat> is that okay? So this is the, the first push to the stack. So let's just say the next operation is we're going to push another value. Let's say we push seven on the stack. So what is that going to do? First thing is we move the stack pointer down. We decrement the stack pointer, and then we store to where the stack point is pointing to. So that means, now I do have to erase you know, the labeling of the stack here, because you know, otherwise it's going to be on, in the way. So the first thing we do is move, we move the stack pointer down a little bit to the next available location. And then we go back and say, now we store the value of seven to where the stack pointer is currently pointing to. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So let's do one more push and then we'll pop values, okay? So let's say we push one more time, okay? So now we say, let's push the value of two, okay? <clears throat> First thing, move the stack pointer down. So I, I can do this, you know, it will be harder for you to kind of represent this. You can always kind of use you know, like small arrows on the piece of paper to indicate what you have done. <clears throat> or you can just kind of jot down the, the, the time at this point. All right, so after I, have put, after I have pushed five, seven, and two, that is what's gonna happen to the stack. You can see that five is at the highest location and two is at the lowest location. So now let's go ahead and pop some things, okay? So when you pop, you have to specify where do we want to pop the value to. So in the case of assembly language programming, it is always going to be a register. So let's just say that you say pop A, which means I want to retrieve the last item on the stack to register A. So what are we gonna do? The first thing is not to move the stack pointer. The first thing is to dereference the stack pointer. Find out that you know it has a value of two. So that means you know we go like, okay, let's store you know this value of two into register A. And then you move the stack pointer back up again because we're incrementing the stack pointer, as we can see in the code that is right next to us, you know, on the left hand side. <clears throat> so the next operation is I have to move the stack pointer so that it is now going back up to point to the seven. So now the one question that many people would have at this point is, what happened to the two? Aren't we going to you know, kind of get rid of the two? The answer is no. The two gets to stay at the location just as it is, okay? But later on, we'll find out that you, know, you cannot rely on the value of locations that are below where the stack point is pointing to. Okay, but I'm not gonna explain that at this point. So we just focus on the concept of pushing and popping. 
So let's say now we say pop B, which means I'm going to retrieve whatever last item is pushed on the stack that is still on the stack and put it into register B. So the first thing we do is to dereference the stack pointer. We find out that it's pointing to a value of seven. So B gets a value of seven. And then after that, we move the stack pointer. <clears throat> so we move the stack pointer back up so that it is now pointing to the five again. All right. So is that okay so far? Now, I, I know this is difficult for you to capture on a piece of paper because you know, we have uh, the, the registers, you're moving, the point is moving. So it's better, I mean, after the class, okay, if you want to make a little animation, you can do that, okay? You can just kind of time freeze, take a snapshot, time freeze again, take a snapshot, and then just make a animated GIF. I know most of you know how to make an animated GIF because I know many of you like to make memes with animated GIFs. <laughs> so make an animated GIF, okay? Just to show how the stack you know, operates. <clears throat> it is a suggested activity. It is, I'm not gonna grade it, obviously. I got enough st stuff to grade already, so I don't need extra memes to grade. <clears throat> All right, so are we good so far? Let's do one more thing, okay? Let's go ahead and push one more item here, and then let's find out what's gonna happen. So this time, we're gonna push a value of six. What is gonna happen? Well, we follow the same code that is on the left-hand side. You know, we decrement the stack pointer, okay? So now we <clears throat> do the same thing that we did before. We decrement the stack pointer. It's pointing to the location that most likely still has a value of seven, okay? I said most likely because it depends on whether there are little things called interrupts that can happen. But I'm not gonna explain interrupts just yet. Okay, and then what's gonna happen? The second, I, the second thing we need to do is to overwrite whatever location the stack pointer is pointing to with the value of six, because six is what I wanna push. So that means at this point, this location is no longer gonna have the value of seven, it's gonna be overwritten by the value of six. Is that okay? So that's basically how we implement the concept of a stack using just an array and a pointer. Yes? I saw it like popping the, like, we actually remove the value from the stack as well. Or? How do you remove a value from a memory location? You cannot. So the only thing you can do is to copy that value to a register and then you leave the value in that location as is. So it is overwrite but not outright remove like I mean other than burning the transistors corresponding to you know the circuitry for that location of RAM, you cannot remove a location. Okay. okay. Right? Because every location has to have a value, so you cannot quote unquote remove that value. Now you can always overwrite the value with zero, zero or something like that, but it's not needed. So you'll be doing extra operations that you do not need to if you are to say, okay, I want to erase that location or I want to overwrite that location with zero, zero, but there's no need to do that. Alrighty. <clears throat> so now the question is, what does this have anything to do with calling and returning? So let's go back to the C code first and then we get to the assembly code as an explanation. So what we need to do when we are calling, so let's say we're trying to <clears throat> figure out what happens on line seven. So now we have two things we have, to ha we have to do on line seven. The first thing is to push the return address. In other words, we are gonna look at line seven and go like, okay, uh, if when, when the subroutine returns, where is it supposed to go to? Oh, it's supposed to go to line eight or whatever memory address that is corresponding to line eight. So now we push the return address. So pushing the return address is kind of like leaving behind breadcrumbs so that when you're done with something, you know your way back, okay? So we push the return address, then we continue execution at whatever the block of code F is. When F is done, what do you think it's gonna do? It will retrieve the breadcrumb that we left behind earlier. So it's gonna do a pop. So it will pop the return address and then use some, you know, use a particular instruction that we have not talked about yet, okay? In order to continue execution based on the return address. Then we get to line eight. <clears throat> what do we do on line eight? Kind of the same thing, but not exactly. 
we push the return address of line A, but it's not the same return address that we had earlier, because in order for the invocation on, of line H to return, it's going to suppose it's supposed to return to line nine. So we push the return address of line nine on the stack. Then we continue execu execution at function f. Function f does whatever it's supposed to do, and then when it's time for function f to return, once again, it goes to the stack and say, okay, I know the return address has to be here. It pops the return address and then use that to continue execution. In this case, on line nine, and then the, you know, we don't have a return from main in assembly language, so we only do a halt at that point. So is that okay? Does, does everybody understand the relationship, conceptual relationship between the push and the pops and the concept of calling and returning? The whole concept is we leave behind breadcrumbs using the push and then we retrieve the breadcrumbs using the pop. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so what does the assembly code look like in that case? So basically what we are really asking is how do we implement these two in assembly code and how do we implement these two in assembly code? That's basically what we're asking. But before we can answer those questions, do you remember a register called the stack pointer when you were studying the TTP for exam two? Obviously people who did not study for exam two probably cannot answer that question. But even for people who studied for exam two, you go like, I don't remember a register call being called the stack pointer. What do we have? Let's try to remember. We have the program counter, super important, because you know, that source, the location where we're gonna retrieve the next opcode in RAM, okay? That's kind of helpful, useful. Uh, we have the instruction register, which is a temporary register so that we, we fetch, we put it into that location first, and then we decode it later on. We have the microcode pointer, okay? Which is closely related to the instruction register because the so-called decode is really just copying the opcode to the most significant A bits of the microcode pointer and then pad the least significant four bits with zeros. That's our decode. Okay, um, and then we have the flags register. It's a weird looking A bit register. So it stores the carry, the Z flag, the zero flag, the overflow flag, the sign flag, and the L flag. Okay, but that's only useful when we're doing operations with the ALU. Um, and then we got the four you know, registers, registers A, B, C, and D in the register bank. That's about it, okay? I think those are all the registers that we have. We do not have a stack corner. So as it turns out in this class, the four registers, we just have to designate one of them to serve as the stack corner. So, and the, you know, the, for this class, okay, you know, I just say, let's go ahead and use register D as the stack corner. So we, so from here on, register D takes on a special role because it is now going to be served, serving as the stack pointer. So if somebody asks and say, Tech, couldn't we just use register C or B or A as the stack pointer? The answer is yes, I could have, but I have to choose one and I decide to choose register D as my stack pointer. But I could have easily just have chosen the other three registers as the stack pointer as well. So this concept of every register can do everything that we want it to do is called the general purpose register architecture, which is not a common thing in the good old days, but these days, you know, when you look at most of the risk processors, they utilize you know, this particular way of looking at registers. Every register can do whatever other registers can do. <clears throat> All right, so now we look at this piece of code here and see if we can figure out what it is doing. So if, if we already know that register D is the stack pointer, okay, this is what I'll do. I'm gonna overlay with my tablet side by side. So this way, you know, on the tablet, I can kind of illustrate. This is not easy for me because it's not easy for me to spatially map <coughs> the um, uh, code on the left-hand side to the tablet because where I see on the tablet, is not, you know, there's no easy correspondence. I have to use my finger to kind of locate what is a good location for that. There we go. 
All right, so decrement D is um, you know, minus minus SP. So I, I still have to find that location again. Okay, there we go. So minus minus SP or SP minus minus, okay, you know, works out in both ways. Um, so we allocate space on the stack, okay, to prepare for this actual store. And then we have, you know, okay, this is, this may not work out as well as I wanted to, but you know, and then this is getting the value of label L1. Where's L1? L1 is defined right here. So you can see how L1 is defined right after the JMPI instruction. It is the continuation point. When the subroutine is done, when F is done, L1 is where we want to continue execution. That is the breadcrumb that I need to leave behind. But L1 by itself is not a piece of breadcrumb. It is really the location of where the breadcrumb should be placed. So we have the location, but we don't have the breadcrumb yet. So the next one, which is the ST instruction, that creates the breadcrumb. The breadcrumb exists as one byte, in this case, on the stack that is basically the location of where we need to go back to when the subroutine is done, okay? So the next location or the next instruction is kind of doing, you know, what you know, this is doing, okay? It is basically, you know, saying, whatever the stack point is pointing to, let's store L1, the value of label L1 to whatever the stack point is pointing to. Is that okay? So it's a push operation. It really is a fancy push operation where we push the return address. The return address, is has a symbolic name of L1 in this case. And then the JMPF, JMPIF instruction is not a part of the push operation, but it is a part of the operation when we say, oh, we are calling a subroutine. So the calling of a subroutine involves saving the return address plus the continuing of execution at where the subroutine is. So the entire sequence from line one all the way up to quote unquote line five is calling a subroutine. Are we still doing okay so far? Are we relating this to the earlier discussion of the stack? Okay. <clears throat> and also to the um, high level language concept of calling a subroutine. So we're good, okay. What about returning? When we are at the end of the subroutine F, you know, what, do, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna retrieve the uh, return address, which is the bre breadcrumb that we left behind a little bit earlier. So the retrieving process is a pop operation, which means once I retrieve that value into register A, I do not need that on the stack anymore. So I, in I increment the stack pointer so that that location can then be reused for other purposes. And then we have this one new instruction that we haven't seen before. So what I'll do is I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna comment on that one too. And I can do this. There we go. So without that, you know, but it changed the, uh, the relative, relative positioning of things too. So let me see if I can change the browser so that it lines up again. Give me a second. Sort of. <laughs> Close enough. Okay. All right. So I just have to find out where, which, where I need to write here. Okay. So this is. So I can say register A gets whatever the stack pointer is pointing to. And then we increase the stack pointer, okay, on the next line, plus plus SP. And then we continue execution where the stack pointer is. So with this one, you can see how this is the pop operation. You can also see how this is really the push operation that we that we mentioned earlier. This is the same thing as pushing L1, which is our return address. And this is basically the same thing as popping whatever is, was the last item that we push on the stack into register A. The JMPA instruction is not a part of the pop operation, but it is a part of the return operation. So that means if I need to say, what is the call operation? The call operation will consist of all of these. This is what we call the call F operation. And then in terms of returning, it would also include the last instruction. This is where we say, this is a return view. This is how we return to what, you know, the caller of the subroutine. 
Is that okay so far? I think this picture is really helpful, even though it's kind of <clears throat> not drawn professionally, I can probably make a better version of this. But this is the first time I try to use this tool in this way to illustrate, you know, the call versus the return. So I think, you know, if not for anything else, just kind of write down the timestamp, it's 11.05, because then you can come back to this particular screen, then you can do whatever you want, right? Take, you know, pause the playback, take a screenshot, do whatever you want. Now you might be saying, well, doesn't it, it, doesn't it make sense to have an instruction just to push something, another instruction just to pop something, another instruction just to call a subroutine, another instruction to do a return from a subroutine? Yeah, that's what the Intel processor has, okay? It has push, pop, call, return. But my TTP does not, okay? So TTP, TTP does not have those as individual instructions because I'm trying to force you guys to understand how it works, okay? So I'm using a risk reduced instruction set computer approach just so that you guys have to go through this process and understand, oh, so when we are calling, we are pushing the return address and then we jump to the subroutine. When we're returning, we are really popping the return address to a register and then we do an indirect jump, which I'll explain in just a little bit, to where the register is pointing to, okay? All right. So do we have any questions about what is on the projector at this point? No questions? Okay, all right. So if there are no questions, we are going to actually write the program, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I will go ahead and write the code corresponding to the C program that I was using earlier and then we're going to use Logisim to actually run this code, and then we'll use the uh, trace analyzer tool to actually take a look at <clears throat> how all of these steps you know, happen. Okay, so so this way you know you have a kind of a different way of looking at the whole thing because now we can look at exactly what is going on when the program executes. All right, so what we're going to do is to switch to a dumb terminal or command line interface. Uh, this one, eh, might as well. This one is usable. Okay, so I'm gonna clear the screen, go back here, and we'll have a program called call return. So we'll, hmm. okay, so I can do this. I can you know, basically expose a part of the C code, and then this time I only have to implement the whole thing in assembly. So we start with a no op instruction. This is mandatory if you want to use the tracing ability of the assembler tool, is you have to start with a no op instruction. It, is, it has to do with a bug in Logisim, because if I don't start with a no op instruction, you know, it just does not get things initialized correctly. So I have to start with a no op instruction. So the next thing we need to do is to um, initialize the stack pointer. So when we initialize the stack pointer, we basically initialize it to zero. You go like, really? Why would it be zero? I thought the location right after the last byte of the entire memory space is FF plus one in hexadecimal, which means it is supposed to be one, zero, zero. But the register is only a bit wide. Okay, so hexadecimal one, zero, zero is really the same thing as just zero, zero, okay? So initializing the stack pointer to be zero is fine because when you decrement one from zero, what do you get? You get FF, okay? So it works just as well, okay? So we initialize the stack pointer and then we do a JMPI to main because I am going to define the functions in the same order as they are defined in the C code. So that means you know, the definition of F is gonna be here the definition of main is gonna be here. When main is all done, we're gonna have a halt instruction because there's nothing to return to in TTP. There's no operating system, there are no processes, there are no, there's nothing to return to. So when you're all done with your program, the only thing you can do is to halt. Okay, so now we, let's start with main first, okay? So when we start with main, the first thing we want to do is to call F. So how many things do we have to do when we call a subroutine? Okay, let's, let me write down you know, what we need to do. 
first thing is to push the return address. Then we continue execution, jmp uh, jump to the subroutine that we're calling, okay? So how do we push the return address? First thing is to define the return address first, which is L1 in this case. You can choose some other name that is more useful or more it you know, makes more sense. Let's do that. Let's make a label that makes more sense. So we'll say um, <coughs> continuation address after first call to app. Okay, that's a really long name, but I think it is self-explanatory in this case. This is what we call your self-documenting code. Okay, so we have to push the return address, which is the label. Okay, the label is representing the return address. So we, what do we do? We decrement D, okay? Reserve one byte on the stack, and then do LDI. You can choose whatever register you want to use. Register A, B, or C is fine. Register D is not good, okay? Because it is our stack order. So let's say just take register B, okay? And then now we have to use the long continuation address after first call to F, okay? So you load the value of the label, which is the address of right now, is the address of the halt instruction. But later on it won't be because we're gonna add some more code. <clears throat> into register B, and then we just do a stdb, which is basically store the return address on the stack. And then we have the jump to F, well, that's easy, jmpi to F to get a, to get a job done. So that's how we implement you know, the first call to F, and then we, when we get back, it's going to be whatever at the location right after the label of continue address after first call to F. So this is where we have to implement the second call. So the second call is going to look exactly like the first one, except the return address is different. So what I can do is to say, let's copy line 8 to line 14 to where I am at this point. Okay. So I just did a copy and paste here. And the only thing I have to do is to say, oh, this is not the first call. This is my second call. So I have to change the label name, okay, so it reflects it what it is, which is the second call to F, and then change the reference to the label, because if I mistakenly use <coughs> continue address after first call to F, then it's going to continue execution back here, then it becomes, quote unquote, a loop, because you know, we are returning back to the point where the call happens again. So we definitely don't want to do that. All right. So if somebody was to ask, well, we used register B before, can we use register A this time? Sure, not a problem. Pick whatever register you want. As long as line 18 and 19 are consistent using the same register, and line 10 and 11 are consistent using the same register, A, B, or C are fine, okay? <clears throat> what about the return code? Well. The return code requires a little bit more attention because I still have not explained what is a JMP to A. So let me just go back to the tablet here instead of the opcode table. So JMP, whoops, um, well, I'm supposed to be using the writing tool. Oh, it is sleeping. <laughs> it timed out and slept. Thank you. So a JMPA is really the same thing as PC equals to A. In other words, that's all we do. Look at what register A has and then use that to update the program count. Okay? So that's our indirect job. Okay, this is how we say Oh, we need to continue execution someplace else. Where is that someplace else? Oh, register A has the address. Okay, just copy register A over to the program counter. Okay, so that's what JMPA is going to do. So with that explanation, now we can go back to the code because that's what function F needs to do is to immediately return. So we have to retrieve whatever the stack point is pointing to. So that's an LD. Uh, you can pick whatever register you want. Let's pick register C then. So register C and D here. 
So basically, we now basically say C is whatever the stack pointer has. But after we retrieve, that location is now quote unquote used or retrieved. So that means I don't need that location on the stack anymore. So when we deallocate that location, we just have to increment the stack pointer by one. So this is the same thing as you know, SP++ or plus plus SP, either way is fine. And then the last one is to say, oh, register C has the location where we, where we need to go. So let's use JMPC so that basically we're doing the same thing as update the program counter using register C. That's basically what it does. So then we end up jumping back to the continuation point or whatever you saved earlier. <clears throat> All right, so this is the entire program. I just need to make sure that we have a halt instruction at the end. And now I can go back and explain why we have line three, which is a jump. Because if I don't have line three, the first thing it's gonna do is line six, which is not what the program wants to do. It has to start with main. So that's why I have to make sure that we continue execution in main first and not in the subroutine that we're defining that main is supposed to call. All right. So I'm gonna pause a little bit just to see whether there are questions about the code that is on the projector at this point. Yep. Um, could you also define the F below main? Well, F is defined on line five. So does it have to be defined before you call it? Or no. Okay. Yeah, you can you can look at the line. Okay. In the assembler, it does not care about the ordering of references versus the definition. So unlike C, now if you were to write this code in C, and you have definition f of f you know, after main, it's going to complain unless you have a prototype. But that's more of a extra checking kind of thing because you know, C could have done it in a way where it really should not doesn't complain either. All right. So are we ready to run this code? Okay. All right. So we're going to run it. <clears throat> I will do it the long way, yeah, just so that you know we know how to do this. You know, using the command line tool and not using the shortcut tool. So let me go back to the modules first. So this is the module that we are on right now. It is right after a link to a tool that is one of my students wrote years ago. Uh, it is combining the jobs of the assembler, the emulator, and also the tracer. is a command line tool. Um, I have not personally used it, so if you want to experiment with that, that's all good. Uh, tracing TTPSM code execution is just a long description of how to get things done. Okay, so this is all kind of like just a whole lot of manual process. <clears throat> the key is you have to do it a few times. Okay, the first time you do it is really awkward. It's like, what do I do next again? What option do I have to change? But the more you do it, the quicker you can do it again. So that's the other thing. And for those of you who say, okay, I want the automated tool that TAC has, so RipperSpider.zip is going to work on Mac OS and Linux. If you have a Windows machine like the school computer here, you can also use Omer's uh, port of the Ripper Spider for PowerShell. All of these computers have PowerShell already installed, which means you know, once you have everything configured on a thumb drive, all you have to do is to bring your thumb drive here or have it on Google Drive, whatever, plug it in or unzip the file from Google Drive, then you can use it again, okay? So there are different ways to do it. All right, but I'm gonna do it the long way this time. So that means you know I need to go back to the code here, and I need to put the entire program into the clipboard. So I have a tool to do that too. Okay, so now my entire program is in the clipboard. I switch to, oh, no, not that, switch to the assembler. and go to the source tab. There we go, the source tab. Remove whatever we I had before, which is the same program from my Tuesday, Thursday class last Thursday. And now paste the program in. Wait for it to fully assemble the whole thing. Make sure I don't see anything in column B because any error will be reported in column B. And now I can go to RAM file and then do a file download CSV. This is going to be the content of RAM, so I'm going to download it as callred.csv. I just like to use the same name you know, so that it's consistent. And now I have to run it in the command line. 
So let me go back to the command line. All right, so I'm going to do this the long way. Okay, so it's java-jar. I'm going to have to specify where do I find logism.jar. So that's going to be a long path in this case because that's where I put things. Uh, CISP 310 processor and then logism 310.jar. Then I can specify the circuit file this time. Okay, so this is going to be the processor 0004.circ, which is in the same directory, which means I have to specify that long path again. Okay, <clears throat> so processor 0004.circ, like that. Then I can specify dash load, which allows me to load the RAM file into the RAM component on the command line. So this way I don't have to do it manually. So it is in the temp folder, it's called callred.csv, which I got earlier from the assembler. <clears throat> and then I have to specify dash tty, which means you know, I don't want to run it in the GUI mode, I want to run this on the command line mode. So we have to specify table after this, so the output is more of a tab separator table. So I can actually do this now. I can just press the enter key and it just gives me a bunch of zeros and ones. If I have enough time, I can interpret that. Okay, but it's not easy. Okay, so this is not the ideal way to do it. So what I do is I use a redirect symbol, which is the greater than symbol, and capture the output to a file that I'm gonna call uh, call return.tsv, which stands for tab separator value instead of comma separate the value. So it would appear that nothing happened because the output is redirected to the file, so it's not going to appear on the screen. So then, now I switch back to the tool. I go to trace raw data. I go to file, go to import, go to upload. So instead of trying to catch up with me and copy everything down, you can jot down the time right now, which is 11.21, okay, so this way you know kind of approximately where to go back to in the video replay. Um, and then I go to the temp folder, go to the TSV file, select it, press the enter key. And then you have, you have a few more steps to go. So you go to replace current sheet, okay, that's important. Replace current sheet and then specify the separator is a tab and turn off, convert text to numbers, dates, and formulas. Import data, click that, and then wait for the uh, Google Sheets to magically get everything done. Then we can go to the Analysis tab. So the Analysis, the analysis tab is now going to show you where did I, did I get the opcode, what is the opcode on which line of the program. Now the opt, the uh, no opt instruction did not do a single thing useful. It did not read, read any RAM location. It did not overwrite any RAM location. It did, it did not change any register, and it did not change any flags. Why? Because it's called a no-op instruction. <laughs> That's why it's called a no-op instruction. It is no operation. Doesn't didn't do a single thing. The next one is at location zero one, and if you look at it, it is this is the op, this is the actual mnemonic, and this is what it did. Okay, it put a zero into register D. Seems to make sense, okay, because it's LDI D zero, so putting a zero into register D is kind of what you expect. The next one is a JMPI instruction. Technically, it didn't do anything except to alter the path of execution. So the next location that it execute is now at location zero eight, as opposed to location zero five. Location zero five, tech, you cannot add. Because this is at location 0, 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, not 5. Why do you think I said location 5? Because JMPI, yeah. Uh, because JMPI is two byte. Yep, because JMPI is a two byte instruction. So if the jump did not happen, if it were conditional, then it would have continued execution at location 0, 5 and not 0, 4. So location 0, 8 is the beginning of the main program. Um, the first thing it did was to decrement the stack pointer. The stack pointer becomes FF. The next thing it did was to load the label into register B. So register, oh, this is not good, is it? Because it says, this is location B. It's supposed to load it into register B, but register A got changed instead. All right, something is not right here. 
Hmm. I wonder, did I use the right program to do it? Okay, let me, we'll, we'll keep going like this, okay, until I find out exactly what's wrong with the program. But this is supposed to be register B is updated to zero E. And then we store whatever register B has to whatever the stack pointer is pointing to. The stack pointer is FF, so location FF is going to change to whatever register B is supposed to have. So it is 0E, it got updated. And then we continue execution at location, uh, at the subroutine F, which is starting at location 05. And the first instruction we encounter is this instruction here. It did not give me... This is not, this doesn't seem right to me. Yep. It did everything correctly, but the decoding part of this is wrong. It is not supposed to be in register A. So this is supposed to be in register C because you know, this is an LD instruction using register C. So that makes me think that I uploaded an incorrect TSD file. So let me double check the process. Um, okay, so that's a recent file. And we go back to trace raw data. Let me just re-upload this just to double check. So we import again. Upload. And we are looking at this TSD file. Replace current sheet. Tab. Do not convert. Import data. And let me go back to analysis. Not updating it. Huh. Well, we have a problem. <laughs> Let me try another way to do this and see if that makes a difference. Because if I made some, okay, let me see if I can do this. Give me a second here. Okay, so this is me using Ripple Spider. So instead of having to do everything by hand, I just have to say, this is the source file. It did everything else for me. So it did the assembling, it downloaded the assemb it downloaded the RAM file contents, it ran the simulator Logisim, it collects the output or the trace from Logisim, and then it upload the trace data back up to the tool. So all I need to do is to go back to the assembler spreadsheet and go to the analysis tab and this time it did it correctly so something is not right about the other trace file because we can see how the LDIB is loading into register B correctly so this trace is correct <clears throat> when we retrieve whatever the stack one points to it is retrieving that to register C as expected we add one to the stack pointer which is FF at this point so it increments to zero zero and then we do a JMPC instruction. The JMPC instruction is going to continue execution based on what register C has. So that's why it continue execution at location zero E. So this trace is correct. So it has to be something that I did with the file. I think I, think I uploaded the wrong file, but I'm not sure. All right. And you can also see how this output is a lot more dense. You know, there are no empty rows. So that's why you know, I personally prefer to do it this way. The other way should have worked as well, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure yet you know, why it did not work the first time. <clears throat> All right, so this is another way of demonstrating what happens okay, you know, when you run this program, you know, and you can actually see how we overwrote locations on the RAM and again over here, because you know, after we call the first time, we have a second call. So the second call is saving 1.4 to the same location because 1.4 is where we need to continue execution after the second call to F. 
Are we kind of doing okay so far with the demonstration? All right, so as I said earlier, okay, the understanding the instructions is really important. In other words, <clears throat> oh, I know why. Okay, I can explain it now. The process was done correctly. What I did not do, oh, okay, but I changed this source code too. Okay, never mind. <clears throat> I still cannot explain it yet. So any, anyway, so at this point, as you can probably imagine, understanding what LD does or increment, uh, LDI, what ST is going to do, all of these are really, really, they're really important right now. We don't really care about the multiplexers or the demultiplexers at this point. We just need to know, in the end, what does each instruction do? Not so much how it gets the job done, it is what does it do, okay? <clears throat> Are there any questions? So this is not, I'm saying that this is, I'm not saying this is an easy concept, you know, because we are starting off with the high level programming concept of calling and returning. We talked about the stack, which is the last in first out construct. We talked about how to implement pushing and popping in C code, and then we translate that into assembly code, and then we, and then the, the next step was the most important one, is how do we connect pushing and popping to how we call a subroutine and how we return a, from a subroutine. So the concept of pushing the return address and popping the return address is really important. That's, I would say that is the pivotal concept in today's lecture, is to make a connection of that to the stack concept and then to the concept of calling and returning. All right, so I'll let you guys kind of you know sink in a little bit by let's do a row activity. So I'm gonna take row right now. Today's date is the 13th. So let me unhide this, and I'll show you the access code. It's just compile c o m p i l e or lowercase. Right, so I'm gonna show you, you know, JMP instruction here because it's not, it's, it's, it's no surprise because we just talked about it. So if you look at, at the JMP X instruction, which is row 25, that's exactly you know, what I described a little bit earlier. Whatever register you specify as X here is whatever is providing the content or the value to update the program counter. So that's you know, kind of the same thing that I talked about earlier, except this is also in the optional <coughs> table. Right. So today's new lab is not going to be, it's, it's not relating to calling and returning because I know this concept may take a little bit longer to sink in. So the lab today is about uh, compiling C control structures. Um, so that's a, it's a relatively easy lab, okay, for the most part. Um, and I'm considering Actually, oh, you guys cannot see it because I'm pointing to a screen that you cannot see. <clears throat> so let me get back to this one. All right, so today's lab is 
you cannot see it yet. I have not un unhidden it yet. So this is the lab that you're gonna do today. It has to do with C control structure. It does not have to do with stack concepts. So I'm starting to stagger the concepts you're being introduced in class versus what you'll be doing in the lab, which kind of gives you a little bit more time for the concepts to sink in. But the concept is not gonna sink in unless you kind of revisit the material. So that means you know, it is super important. I would personally, okay, read ahead of the class, which means, okay, what is Tech gonna talk about today? It's just whatever link is after the one that I just talked about. Two is to go back to the video, okay? Just kind of go back to the key timestamps, okay? So that's one thing that you can do in class is instead of trying to copy everything that I do, which is not possible, okay? Copy the time for, you know, the timestamps and then just kind of comment next to the timestamp. It's like, okay, Tech started to talk about how to um, work with the tool to collect the trays and you know, explain you know, the result of running a program. So copy that timestamp so that you can easily go back to, the, to that particular point in the recording. But reading ahead is important. Going back to the lab that you have done already is also important because the lab instruction, I structure it so that it also contains instruction. So that means you know, what the, the material for this class is not just the links here. So you can see that there are certain instructions here. Um, okay, so I need to scroll a little bit lower to, see, to show that. So this is the formal you know, uh, module that I wrote that explains you know, how calling and returning works. But the lab is another part of it. Um, so I'm not sure what else to tell you in terms of you know, how to study for this class at this point of this, you know, of this semester. Um, the things are, no pun intended, things are really stacking up in this class. You know, because you know, everything, I mean, the next thing that we're gonna talk about, okay, can someone guess what I'm gonna talk about next? That we, we have just finished this particular module today. This, yeah. We can talk about recursion next time. Yep, caller call call agreement, okay? So you basically just keep going. And there are two of these. They are basically the same thing. Um, what these two are describing is what is the caller assuming? What is the callee assuming? What is their contract? What, what can they count on? Okay, you know, okay, I'm the callee, I'm expecting the caller to set up the stack like this. And therefore, this is where I'm gonna go look for blah, 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 okay? So that's the, that's the agreement. The next one, the next uh, lab assignment has to do with stack operations. So that's what we're gonna do on Wednesday. Um, so that's kind of the important stuff you know, that we're gonna talk about in this class. We only got five class meetings or so you know, to continue at this point. So the material is not gonna slow down. It's gonna, I would say, it will speed up from certain people's perspective, but it's actually going to make even more sense for some other people. It depends on whether programming is what you really like to do versus you, know, you like the lower level you know, circuitry or whatnot. All right, so I'm gonna kind of let you guys ask questions at this point. Are there any questions? Okay, let me ask you, let me, since you don't have a question, so I'll be the one asking the question. Does this help explain certain things that you could not explain knowing only C and C++? Like, how do I call some routine? How does it know where to get back to? Okay. Very good. So the next thing we can do is recursion. Okay, you know, how many people have done recursion? In other words, you have written subroutines that are recursive. Okay, so pretty much the whole class. As it turns out, you know, so recursion as a concept is a little bit abstract, it's a little bit mysterious. It's like, what do you mean that each invocation has its own local variables? It's like, that concept is really kind of difficult to understand. So what I'll do, you know, since we do have a little bit of time left here right now, is I'm gonna do it in C++ first, or just regular C, but I'm gonna do it in uh, GDB. So GDB is a great tool for demonstrations like this. So I can use the usual factorial program, okay, so I'll just call it fact.c. 
So when you implement you know, factorial using a recursive subroutine, um, I will use a particularly inefficient way of doing this, but it's easier for me to illustrate the concepts this way. So I'm going to use f here and unsigned n. This is going to be a long version to do this. Uh, we have unsigned result. Okay. We have a conditional statement. If n is 0, then result is 1, because 0 factorial is by definition 1. Otherwise, we kind of do it in a recursive way. So to do it in a recursive way, I intentionally make it, you know, like super, um, no, I don't have to do this. Um, okay. F of n minus 1, okay, n minus 1, okay. And that is going to be the recursive call of f of n minus 1 like that. And then my own return value, which is result, is result is f, f of n minus 1 times n itself. Okay, so that is going to implement your fa n, uh, n factorial. And then main, just need a call to f of n. So we'll just say f of 3, okay, in this case. So f of 3 in this case is going to be 3 times 2 times 1 times the 0 factorial. So that should be four levels of recursion until the recursion stops. Okay. So you look at this program. It doesn't have any C out. It doesn't have any printf. How am I going to illustrate anything with a program like this? So the trick or the magic is GDB or the debugger. So when I run this program in the debugger, I can say, okay, show me function f. And I need to put the breakpoint on line 6 because that is when the recursion ends. Um, I can also put a breakpoint on line 3 or line 4, which is the entry point of the entire subroutine, like so. So now I can just run the code. This is the first time it hits the breakpoint. It shows me that we are in f, but it shows me something better. Which invocation of f are we talking about? We are talking about the invocation of f where n, the parameter, has a value of 3. So it gives me the context of where you know, the breakpoint is or which invocation we are talking about. So this is on line 4. n is not 0 at this point. Why? Because I can print it. n is 3 right now. So we, when we single step, it's going to go to the else case. The else case says you know, the first thing is, oh, we need to call, n, call f recursively to get the value into f of n minus 1, which is what f n m1 is representing. So when I single step, if I continue execution, it's going to get me to another breakpoint. Okay? So right now, you go like, okay, hold on a second here, Tech. <clears throat> we had a breakpoint earlier when n equals to 3. Now we have another breakpoint, and it is in the same function, on the same line, but this time n is 2. I don't see how these two are related. So this is where BT or backtrace as a feature in a G, G, GDB is going to be really, really helpful. So backtrace, which is abbreviated to BT, so I don't have to type a whole lot, shows you how we got here. So it shows us that we are currently in, um, so, okay. These are called frames, okay? You know, we'll explain the concept of a frame later on too. So these are frames. Frame zero is the last frame. It's, when you look at the stack, this is the last thing that we push. The most recent invocation is frame zero. Frame one is the one before that. Frame two is the one before that. Is that okay? So it shows us you know, how we start in main on line 18 of main, it called f the first time. Then we got into the first invocation of f on line 10. That called f again, and this is where we are inside f on line 4 right now. So it showed us the entire thing. So we can continue again, and now when we do a bt, it shows us that, oh, okay, with this invocation, we now have three concurrent invocations of f. Okay? And you can kind of see this like a stack too. 
when you call a subroutine, when you invoke a subroutine, it's like a push because we are basically adding one more level of invocation basically on the stack. Except we're looking at entire frames now. So when we continue one more time, then this time you'll f uh, n equals to zero as the parameter. So when we do a BT, we can now see that there are four invocations of f that we have done from main. Main calls f the first time, f calls itself the second time, f calls itself the third time, f calls itself the fourth time. Are we good so far? Okay. So when you look at this and you say, but I want to go back and look at the local variable of, let's say, the, the frame two. I want to see what the local variable of result looks like for frame two. Okay, let's just say that's what we want to do. Well, you can do that. So the way you do it is to say, I want to switch from frame zero, because frame zero is always the default. So I can say, I want to switch from frame zero to frame two, which means Everything is still intact. You are not popping anything. You're not changing the path of execution. You're really just changing which frame should I be looking at at this point. So when I look at frame two, I can now say, give me the value of result which is uninitialized at this point in frame two. It is a zero. But you can now differentiate between the local variables by looking at the addresses. So from the perspective of frame two, the address of result ends with F zero C. Let's go back to frame zero. So we go back to frame zero, and we ask the same question. Where is result? We go like, oh, not the same. So from the perspective of frame zero, result is at the location of, okay, I'm just gonna use the last three digits in hexadecimal, EAC as opposed to F zero C. So you can see that the later the frame, the lower the memory address. Do you remember when we push, which way do we change the stack pointer? Decrement becomes a lower value. So this is a really great tool to illustrate what happens when you have recursive subroutines. Because you can go to any frame that you want and you can print the address of local variables. Then you will start to understand it's like, oh, so every frame has its own result. By changing to the frame's perspective, we can now go like, okay, but I want to see what other variables or what are the values of the other variables of a particular frame. We can easily do that. How many people have taken 430 at this point? Okay. Well, this, is, this would have been a great tool for CISD 430 because you have recursive subroutines that deal with trees, right? So this would have been a great tool to debug those particular algorithms because you, know, you can actually stop it. You can go back to an earlier frame and go like, I don't think we're supposed to be here. Who steered the program in the wrong direction so that I'm here now? You can just use the frame, go back one level. It's like, okay, that, that frame seemed to be doing the right thing. What about the one before? You can, you can then debug your program even though the bug is at a frame different from frame zero of you know, basically where you are at this point. So for those of you who are going to take CISP 430, I would say invest a little bit of time to learn how to use GDB, particularly how to look at different frames when you have recursive subroutines. When you're writing programs that, that, are, that are not recursive, this concept is not as helpful, okay? It's still helpful, but not, not as helpful. When you're writing recursive subroutines, this is a really, really important and effective tool for debugging your logic in the programs. For those of you who are thinking, but tech, you, you won't understand because you don't write anything that has bugs. I can tell you that is totally untrue, okay? <clears throat> it's not the fact that I do not write programs without bugs. I write programs with all kinds of careless bugs. The question is how quickly can I locate and contain those bugs, okay? That comes with experience, but it also has to do with what tool you are using to debug the program. All right, so this is kind of like a preview of what we are going to do, because what we'll do in this class are going to be, is going to be, we're gonna deal with structures, okay? So if you are forgetting what a structure is in C, you might want to review that before we actually get to that topic. We'll also deal with recursion, okay? And then you will find out that 
most of the questions you might have about recursion is like, how, what, what is going on here? You might be overthinking. Because the concept of recursion is really, really simple. Now, it doesn't mean that to come up with a recursive logic is easy, but if you're given a recursive logic, which I will do for this class, and you just have to follow that logic, it is not as difficult as most people think it is. All right, so it is 11.50, so I'm gonna let you guys get started with the lab by at least uh, giving you the access code to the lab. Did I do that? Okay. All right, so let's do that. <clears throat> so today's lab is compiling C control structures, and the access code is GCC right here. I'm considering changing the attempts from unlimited to something that's like, it will still be a lot, like 10. Something like that. Would it? Would Would anyone object if I change the attempt, you know, the number of attempts to something like ten, instead of unlimited? <laughs> Why would it matter? Is it a psychological thing or is it a practical thing? If you keep getting And you have to get my attention. I think that is probably the whole point is, you know, you get my attention if you cannot get all the points, you know, after 10 times, so that I can help figure out, you know, you know do you, are you not, are you misunderstanding a particular concept? If so, what is the concept that you're misunderstanding? So I might actually do that, you know, next time. <laughs> is to change it from unlimited to like 10 times. So after 10 times, I'm not saying I won't give you extension, but you have to talk to me so that I can get involved in the process. It's like, okay, why would why did it take you 10 attempts? Which concept is still kind of a little unclear to you? Can I help clarify that concept? So that, be, that becomes a way for me to kind of get involved in the process. So I might experiment with that on Wednesday. Not today, Wednesday. All right, so I am going to go back to my office, you know, get something to drink, and then I'll be back here in a few minutes. But you guys can continue with the lab at this point. All righty. Oh, and also, if you are getting a score from an earlier lab, and you're not really quite sure, you know, why am I not getting the, all the points, or you know, you're not understanding my comment, uh, just let me know, and I can do that lab in class, so I can explain that, you know, in class as well. So, you know, but without anyone prompting me, I'm not, usually I do not do that, but if you prompt me, you know, I'm more than happy to just kind of do the labs in class, so I can help explain the concepts along the way. All right, so I will, Stop the recorder, you know, upload the recording.